Tina Koto, ko Andrew Tokuingwa, ke Titari Tafinua Aho e Mahiana, ko Ngara Tonga Ko Papa Atafai Toku Ropu Mahi, ko Kayara Hiropu Toku Turanga Mahi, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Tato Katoa. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us at today's webinar hosted by Ngara Tonga Ko Papa Atafai, which is Charity Services. We're part of the Department of Internal Affairs. My name is Andrew, I'm a team leader here, and I'll be doing a bit of an introduction and then going over some housekeeping before we start the presentations. Today, we have speakers from Hapai Hapori Community Operations, which is also part of DIA, and Matatika Mataronga Kai Totoko, the Fundraising Institute of New Zealand, also known as FINS. Each speaker will discuss different funding and fundraising options for charities post COVID. Throughout the webinar, you'll hear us refer to a bunch of different resources. Afterwards, we'll send out a list of those so you can have a look. We'll also upload a video to this webinar to the Charity Services YouTube channel so you can come back to this information later. Before we kick off, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about logistics and let you know how the webinar will run. Hopefully at this point, you're able to hear us without too much interference. Uh, if you are having any issues, please try one of the solutions covered on the slide. Importantly, this is a listen-only webinar, so if you have any funding-related questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will do our best to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. If your question doesn't get answered, you have more questions afterwards, or you think your question might be a bit more complex, please email us at events at charities.govt.nz. We're more than happy to assist. If you like, you can also book in for a one-on-one -on -one online catch-up with someone from Charity Services or Hapai Hapori every Thursday. You can find more details about that on our website. Finally, thank you for bearing with us throughout this webinar. We do apologize in advance for any technical issues you might experience. So, a brief background on the webinar and what our presenters will be talking about today. There are lots of ways that charities fund their activities, and it's important to explore whether any of these work for your charity in a post-COVID environment. Usually, you might seek donations and bequests from the public, run fundraising events like fun runs or sausage sizzles, get subscriptions from members, get paid to do services for government or other charities, or raise funds through business activities. Unfortunately, a lot of these will have been impacted by COVID-19. So our big focus today is gonna to be one of the main funding sources, grants. Grants are provided by government agencies or philanthropic organizations like community trusts or foundations. You can use them for any aspect of your operations, such as one-off projects, administration, or even specific events. Many of you will already be familiar with the existing funding structures. However, as our presenters will show you, a lot of grant makers, including the government, have put aside specific grants to help charities through the impacts of COVID. Many of you, oh, the main requirement of most grants is that you have a legal structure. This usually means you incorporate it with the company's office. If you don't know what this means, the resources we send out will include a great little blog that our people put together to explain the difference between being a registered charity and being incorporated as a legal entity with the company's office. But who gives grants and what's available at the moment? Well, we're lucky enough to be joined by two community advisors from Hapai Hapori, Trish Hughes and Maggie Regan. They'll give an overview of the kind of grants available and then a bit more detail on the grants that the DIA offers. We're also really pleased to be joined by Michelle Berriman from FINS. She's gonna to talk to us about ethical fundraising, the broader context of fundraising options. She has some great tips on how you can fundraise more effectively. After all of that, as I said, we'll be answering some of the questions you've sent us. With all of that out of the way, I'd like to introduce you all to Trish Hughes. Trish comes to us today from Christchurch, where she's worked as a community advisor for eight years. Before that, she worked for the Ministry of Social Development and its predecessors for a long time. Trish's passion is supporting communities to make their dreams a reality. She's gonna start her presentation with some key findings from the COVID survey conducted by Phil Phil Philanthropy New Zealand in May this year. Kia ora, Trish. Thanks, Andrew, and Kira Kato, everyone. I'd like to start my presentation with some key findings from the May 2020 Philanthropy New Zealand COVID survey. Just to give you some, some perspective on how the funding environment has changed due to COVID. The survey focused on some of the key funders and shows that due to COVID, 65% of funders expect to fund at the same level or increase their funding this year, while 21% of funders are likely to decrease their funding. 
Many funders responded rapidly to the changing environment and funders have specifically earmarked at least 21 million to tackle COVID impact. There's been some significant collaboration amongst funders during the COVID crisis, with many sharing information about funding needs and working with other funders to identify community organisations, which is really good news. So COVID specific funds. In response to COVID, we've seen some funders change their priorities with new funds being announced. The 2020 government budget has also made new provisions for community organisations. And I'll just give you a few examples of these. Um, the Ethnic Communities Development Fund, um, which is available for projects that support ethnic communities to grow their skills, celebrate their culture and take part in society. Due to COVID, this fund's now available for projects or activities that provide an alternative means of staying socially connected, employment initiatives and community resilience and recovery. There's also the community organisations that support women and girls. Um, this is through the Ministry of Women. It's a $1 million fund for organisations that support women and girls in New Zealand. Um, and it's only available for the short term for projects where there is no other government funding available for the same purpose. And in the sports and recreational clubs area, there's the Community Resilience Fund, which is through Sport New Zealand. And that's a $25 million package to provide further short-term relief for organisations at all levels of the play, active recreation and the sports sector. And the government also announced in the budget $264.6 million um, package for sport and recreation sector, which will be available over the next four years and recognise the importance that sport and active recreation play in our society. Um, the government also announced um, that it's supporting communities and community organisations to relieve the impact of COVID. And a couple of examples of these are the $32 million investment over the next two years through the Ministry of Social Development to provide additional support for food banks, food rescue and other community organisations that are providing food to people, families and whanau who can't afford to purchase food. There are other food security funding and grants available, which we will include in the resources to you after the webinar. So the wage subsidy extensions happened as well, and that helps businesses affected by COVID and supports organisations and their staff to maintain employment by supporting employers who are adversely affected by COVID so that they can continue to pay their employees. It's also for supporting workers to ensure they continue to receive income. And it's available for registered charities, incorporated societies and contractors. In charity services, the last webinar they coordinated with the Ministry of Social Development, um, that dealt with a number of questions about how the wage subsidy impacts on charities. And they included those questions and answers in a blog. And they'll link this resource to our resource page for you after this webinar. And just some general information. So if you need help or guidance on funding, please contact us. Your local Hapai Hapori community advisor would be more than happy to help you navigate the options that are available in your region. So before I hand this to the next presenter, I'll quickly mention some funding options that you might want to talk to us about. It is by no means the complete list of options, and I strongly recommend booking some time with a community advisor to talk through these if you want to get a better sense of what is out there. So often local governments have funds available for your community to strengthen or build resilience for other community needs. Check out their websites for more information and contact them. Other options also included are the community trusts and community foundations. These vary in size but give some significant grants every year for a variety of reasons and a number have set up COVID-19 specific funds. The gaming trusts, which raise money from gambling, although these have been closed during the lockdown period, it is advisable to check their websites or contact them to discuss where they are at um, before putting in requests for funding. The Generosity New Zealand website um, is the largest digital search facility for funding information in Aotearoa. They have created three search tools that connect people to scholarship, and grants for individuals, volunteering organisations and community groups, just to name a few. So you will need to pay to access, this, access the service. However, it may be available through your library for free and we suggest you contact the library to confirm if that service is available. 
Charity Services also has a web page summarising funding options for charities in New Zealand that's really good to look at. Um, the link will be included in the material that's being sent out to you following this webinar. So um, thank you for your time and that's the end of my presentation today. Awesome. Thank you, Trish. That was really helpful and informative. Now I'd like to introduce you all to Maggie Regan. Maggie is also a community advisor from Hapai Hapori, and for the past 23 years, Maggie has worked within the education and government arena. She's been with the Department of Internal Affairs since 2003, based in the Palmerston North office. Maggie has a passion for supporting communities to be the best they can be, and today she'll be talking about the various funding options available specifically through DIA. Kia ora, Maggie. Kia ora, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, lovely to be here, guys, and I hope you um, enjoy this um, our presentations. So, um, the Department of Internal Affairs it serves and connects people, communities, and government to build a safe, prosperous, respected nation. Hapai Hapori uh, is a branch within this. We have um, advisory teams located around New Zealand available to work with you and your communities. Community Matters is the central point for all the information that we can provide for in the communities. Um, there's quite a number of different headings um, for funders, for communities, for individuals, for organisations, and the login here. So quite key areas to have a look at. Today's, um, I'll just focus on for organisations. So you can see there, there's quite a, a, a range of things to choose from. So there's things like, you know, where do I get a grant for a project? How do I get some funding towards operational costs or organisational development? Building facilities, feasibility studies, safety, or even earthquake strengthening. So these are all the different range and opportunities you can um, select from here. Um, and it's just a case on finding what interests you, clicking on the information and drilling into the information that it provides around priorities, what it does fund, what it doesn't fund. It's all there for you. So what can we do to help help you? Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, Hapai Hapori is a branch of Internal Affairs. We have advisory teams located all around New Zealand to work with you and your communities. We have a range of services that build that help to build uh, sustainable communities, hapu and iwi in New Zealand. We work with and for communities, hapu and iwi, to support the building of community connection innovation and the empowering of local people to create positive change in their communities. Community advisors across the country can help with quite a range of different things. Um, as you can see from the list there, accessing grants or under understanding what community-led development might look like. You just need to ask. So where to find us? So as I mentioned, we've got offices around the country and there's actually 16 regional offices. Um, so we can support your community or community groups as a facilitator or as a relationship broker, help to connect you with other local people, groups or agencies. We work alongside our uh, colleagues at Charity Services, hence the webinar today, which is great, as well as the Office of Ethnic Communities. And we often have working relationships with local and regional councils, other funders and government agencies. On the home screen for Community Matters, there's a search function. So by simply typing in regional offices, you'll get a, the full list as you can see on the screen. You click on the office closest to where you're based and it will provide you with all the local contact, where they are, contact number or email addresses. Or if you have uh, more of a general and you're just not quite sure, you could go to community.matters at dia.govt.nz uh, with your inquiry where you're based and that will be directed through to the closest office to you. So funding, as Trish touched on earlier, there's quite a range that the department administers. Um, and one of the main ones um, is through the Lottery Grants Board. So this is through the sale of Lotto. There are other um, funds which come from Crown, money or trusts. Most of the funding administered by the department has opening and closing dates. Um, and all the dates that we are for funding we administer is actually on the website. 
Um, and also you can search that in the at the home screen and you can just type in funding dates and it will bring up a list of all the different funding dates or if you have a specific one, um, for argument's sake, if you were looking at Community Leadership Fund, you could type that in, Community Leadership Fund, opening, closing dates, or just funding dates. So just depend on what you're looking for. There are actually other funds that are actually open all year round. Um, there's a, a few on the list in front of you there. Um, so when you're doing a search in the search function, again, if by chance you come across something that um, is... Uh, says beside it, this fund is currently not accepting funding requests, or you're trying to search for something that you know exists, but you just can't find it. I'd encourage you to either contact your local advisor or send an email again to community.matters at govt.nz um, to seek some clarification and some guidance around what other op options there might be if the one you're looking at isn't available or is cl currently closed. So Realme, so to be able to access our, the department's online system, um, you need to have a Realme login. If you're not signed in, if you haven't signed in um, to our grant and client management system before, you'll need to set up a Realme account. The system will prompt you the first time you log into our system. Now a Realme login is a secure way to prove you are who you are. When you use a Realme, Realme login, we know that we're talking to the right person. For this reason, there isn't a Realme login for an organisation, and like with any password, you don't share it with other people. Now, there's two aspects to the Realme. There's a basic level, um, and there's a verified account. We, at the department, we use the basic level. So it's really as simple as your name, your home address, your contact email and phone number. That's the basic level. However, the verified might suit you and what you do and the range of services that you, you might work with, um, as a lot of government agencies use the Realme um, way of logging in. If you already have a Realme username and password, you can use that in this in our site. You don't have to create a new one. So thanks for your time, guys. I hope this has been helpful. Um, at the end of the day, regional advisors are here to support you um, to do the best and do what you're passionate about. So please just ask the question and, and yeah, I look forward to hearing from someone soon. Kia ora. Awesome. Thank you, Maggie. Our final presenter today is Michelle Berriman, the Executive Director of FINS. Michelle comes to FINS after 20 years of working in a variety of roles within the charitable sector, the last 10 or so in fundraising and development. Before becoming a facilitator of change, she was a youth and community development worker supporting children looked after by the state, running community-based projects and working in juvenile lockdown. Michelle is motivated by creating change and making a difference to those facing adversity. She wants everyone to be given the chance to be the very best version of themselves. Today, she'll be talking about ethical fundraising post-COVID. Kia ora, Michelle. Thank you, Andrew, for that warm welcome. I am delighted to be here today and to hopefully share some hints, tips and tools that's going to help you with your fundraising and hopefully point you in the right direction. I've quite a lot to get through today, uh, so I'm going to go straight into it. We're just going to highlight what we're going to talk about today. There's three topics, the informed leadership, the importance of making informed decisions. We're going to look at keep fundraising. If that's my number one takeaway for you today is keep fundraising, do not stop fundraising. And donors and beneficiaries first. Your biggest assets are your donors and your purpose is, your, is for your beneficiaries. It's really important to focus on how you can best serve them. I'd like to start off by introducing you to Ken Burnett. He's one of my superhero fundraisers and he, he laid the foundations for what is, is now known today as relationship fundraising. And Ken, I like Ken's statement, he says that the difference between a merely good fundraiser and a truly great fundraiser is simply that the great fundraiser knows more, that's all. There's also another quote that was Ken inspired by Harold Sumpton when he said, when their hearts and minds first, and their wallets will follow. It's also really important to remember right now, there's no absolute rules, just basic principles that you should already know, that no advance in technology 
our development is going to change that. <clears throat> so what was the impact on COVID? Well, the first few weeks of lockdown and the subsequent rules imposed, particularly around the direct mail space, caused panic. People were thinking and acting with raw emotion and concern for their fundraising. It was, natural, it was a natural reaction to the situation and something that was not written into anyone's strategic plan, but that initial panic has settled down. COVID had an immediate and obvious impact on fundraising activities, especially those around uh, focused on events, face-to-face -face fundraising, as well as those concerns around corporates fundraising and support. Major donors, obviously they have in huge investment portfolios and what was that going to look like? and trusts and foundations for the similar kinds of reasons. I think it's really important to highlight right now that you will know over the last couple of months if your fundraising strategy was heavily reliant on face-to-face -face events and activities. And I think now might be that time to revisit your strategy. We have known for a long time that event-based fundraising is high risk for long-term sustainability for organisations. And the organisations that are thriving and surviving are leading strongly by resetting back to those basic fundraising principles that Ken Burnett wrote about 30 years ago, which is good relationship fundraising. And what matters really most is donor love. There was what happened during the crisis as well, kind of fell into three categories. Those, there was organisations who stopped. They, particularly here in New Zealand, I think we can be quite sensitive to the, the wider picture of what's going on in New Zealand. So some organisations chose to stop, stop spending, cut their communications and their campaigns, kept their heads down and reduced staff and just hoped that they could ride out the storm and when the dust settles. The second group was short-term patching. These are organisations who went out quickly and hard to with emergency campaigns, often focus on the financial shortfalls and it was a bit of an oversight in terms of we need the money we, we, we're going to lose this money opposed to the potential of actual beneficiaries uh, the beneficiary impact for the donors and the cause that these people support and then there was a third group who they led with donor and beneficiary focused approach so I'd like to ask you uh, what, what you think was the best one. And number three is the, is the most effective answer. The core here is that one and two are operational focused not on the donors and the beneficiaries. And number three requires strong leadership and a solid fundraising strategy and the ability to be agile and make changes quickly. So then what is the importance of informed leadership? Focus on the core purpose, have ambition to seek to fulfill your mission and it, what it will take from fundraising, working together with your service delivery, not against your service delivery program to get there. And it's important that you all work together as one organization Review your operation and the very fundamentals of your operation. Look for the gaps that you knew were there before and decide if they're still there. And if they are, be bold and act on those gaps. Review income sources, risks and opportunity and think strategically rather than tactically. It's also really important to engage your teams. Involve and consult. In this, don't be afraid to pull in the coaches, the challengers, the experts, the handholders, the strategists and the creatives. It's not a time for organisations to be alone. Uh, it's not a time for your team personally to be alone. And accelerate change. Change in fundraising has, has been in process for a long time and I think COVID has accelerated or highlighted that in some areas that change isn't happening quick enough. So now is a time for change. If, you can, if, if we can't change now, when is the time to really assess what we're doing? For example, if all of you, if you had a heavily event focused income, now is the time to look at how you can diversify your income. It's also really important to, how do we move forward? Know you make a difference, know your impact and know your donors. Be bold and brave, but more importantly, be authentic. Charities must not stop asking and asking well with urgency. Evidence is overwhelming that people want to give. Tell your story and ask. You don't <clears throat> be bold, be brave and be authentic. Tell your stories with real compassion and believable. And as Ken Burnett says, the truth told well is great fundraising. Be bold, think big. If you don't ask, you won't get. Keep your campaign simple and tell the truth well. And obviously, donor care, look after those donors who have invested in your organisation. 
there are more creative remote ways to fundraise that has have popped up since COVID. There are opportunities to be creative and reach out virtually through crowdfunding platforms, as well as peer-to-peer. -peer. I think peer-to-peer -peer fundraising has huge potential for growth here in New Zealand, especially for smaller charities. And there are other um, ways, methods of, of looking for other income. And Fund of Future is one that has been popped up. There's $250 million waiting to be claimed back from donors to charity. So if, if people have donated to you, please reach out to them, explore Fund a Future. The website's quite clear. And I also believe charity services are working with civil defence around some guidelines of what forms of fundraising can take place under each alert level so you can confidently plan your fundraising activities for the next year. So who worked well in COVID? Who kept fundraising? People who kept fundraising, those who focused on what they could do, uh, still do, what was working before COVID-19, those who focused on their donors and their donors' needs, organisations that focused on empathy, vulnerability and transparency, those who focused on storytelling. It is important to note here that for some organisations, the impact was, was just too great. There was a massive loss of income, not enough reserves, and they're simply not going to be in a position to survive. And it's really important as a sector that we learn from, from these situations and scenarios that have taken place over the last few months. What do we need to do? Donor love. So you, you really need to, now is, is the opportunity to be getting to know your donors and understand them. Your donors will not forget you for it. These are not normal times. In times of crisis, we step up. These are the defining moments that can develop a friendship relationship to a transactional one. These are the times where you go out and get to know your donors, show them that you, you deeply care about them and comfort them. Listen and be empathetic. Listen to their position, ask them how they are, make sure they have access to the things they need. Storytelling. Storytelling changes the world or can change the world. Stories influence people. Stories need to be engaging and inspiring. They can be happy, they can be sad, they can be emotive. People everywhere want to make a difference through the story. And through stories, you can help them make a difference to the causes that people care about. Practice your storytelling across all media until you find the one that works for you and what audience it works for you. Love your stories. You have to love your stories. Leave your donors feeling wonderful. Surprise and delight them. Your story should be as long or as short as it needs to be. It's, it's your story. And also they don't have to be polished. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You make your videos, especially digital. It can be expensive to be creative digitally, but being authentic and getting it done. We have the Code of Ethics um, here at Finns, and the five basic principles are honesty, respect, integrity, empathy, and transparency. Ethical fundraising is vital to the fundraising profession if it's to provide its community with confidence for its causes. Ethical standards should not change because of COVID. At times like this, people turn to us for what we represent. They want heroes they can trust and they want to be inspired. Look at the Sir Captain Tom story in the UK, for example. People are concerned about the future. They want to make a difference, but they also want encouragement from us. People need to give as much as they give to need. We want donors to know that generous, selfless giving is good for you. It makes you happier. It makes you healthier. It's a great thing. And I'm just going to conclude with saying, is it even possible for us to take advantage by simply asking? Fundraising is giving people an opportunity. As fundraisers, everyone wants to change the world. And this is one way to do it right now. We provide the opportunity. We're all affected by this crisis. The world's most vulnerable are affected disproportionately. Now is not the time to feel coy. But nobody should ever feel obliged or feel guilty when they say no. That's our job as fundraisers, to empower and facilitate those that can give, while showing empathy and understanding with those who can't. And that was um, a quote by another expert um, and friend of Finn, Simon Scriver. Thank you all so much for listening to my presentation today. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. And please go to the Finn's website for more information. Thank you. So we do have some time now for a bit of Q&A um, and really wanted to thank you again for all of the questions that you've been raising. So we will try and get uh, through as many of these as we can, but some of them um, we just might not, might not have the chance to get. So if we don't get to your questions, please do email us and we will respond to you afterwards. Um, also, I note that a few of the questions that have been raised so far 
uh, specific to a particular community group or charity, in which case we do really encourage you to get in touch with us or Hapai Hapori to have a bit more of an in-depth discussion on what that might look like. So we had a few that came through ahead of time. Um, so I'll start off with those and then we'll get into some of the, the other ones that have come up. So a question that we had prior to this was, uh, we are a new charity that helps the homeless and struggling families in West Auckland. We provide food and warm clothes for those people from a community centre once a week. We want to be able to provide the service every day, but we need help with paying for a premise to run our services. Are there any types of funds that can help with this? We've approached many community resource centres, but they all seem too busy to help. So I'm hoping that we can hand over to Maggie here and maybe she can give us a bit of information on that one. Thanks, Maggie. Hi, thanks, Andrew. Um, yes, well, the department um, definitely would um, consider requests. We look at quite a variety of different operating costs, so um, premises, definitely. So I would encourage you um, to contact your local advisor in your area, have a really good conversation, and there could be other ways that they could connect up or broker relationships um, in the community. But I think your first step is definitely um, talking with a local advisor. Our lottery funding, lottery community, even COGS, Community Organisation Grant Scheme, it's another funding stream that would um, consider those sort of costs. So just ask the question with a local advisor. Awesome, thanks Maggie. Um, another question that we had come through was, and this is again for, for you Maggie, what does a good funding application actually look like? And when I hear that one, the first thing that comes to my mind is how long is a piece of string? Um, so uh, different people have different um, things that they look for as community advisors. Um, some of the things which probably would be key to think about is having clear outcomes. So what's the end result of what you're trying to achieve? Um, how your request will uh, does align with the priorities of the funder, and that doesn't just apply to the department's funding, it would be any funding across New Zealand. So how do your request aligns with that? Be informative and concise with the information you're providing, and it's okay to use bullet points. You know, bullet points to show the highlight of really what you're trying to achieve is great. Um, there's sometimes between, you know, providing a bit of data, you know, that you've done a bit of research and it shows that there's a need here or there's a, in the community, so showing a bit of data as to how you've got to where you are right there and then. Um, yeah, and thinking about where the real need has come from in the community. Um, but most of all, is, it's, it's asking or being in contact with your local advisor again and having that conversation in the first instance to get a bit of clarity and we can guide you, you know, um, and give you some advice on, on that one. Awesome. Thanks for that, Maggie. Um, so I've just had a question that I've seen come through, which I'll answer live, uh, which was just what is the English version of Hapai Hapori? So that is the Te Reo Māori version of, of community operations. So they, this is where Maggie and uh, Trish both work. So community operations is spread throughout um, the entirety of New Zealand. They have offices all over the country and their advisors are the people who work with you to make sure that you get your funding requests sorted out and all that kind of stuff. So you've got a local office everywhere. So um, further grant funding questions. So are there any grants or funds that can help us recoup our losses during lockdown? We had organized a rally event which had, had to get cancelled because of lockdown and we ended up losing our deposit on the venue and also catering. Trish, are you able to cover that one? Yes. Um, usually with funders, there's no ability for retrospection of payment. So if you've already incurred costs and you weren't funded for them in the first place, it is unlikely most funders would allow for that retrospection and it would be a cost that you'd be expected to meet from your normal operational expenses. Probably not what you wanted to hear, but um, you could check with those that fund you to see if there was any ability maybe to do changes of purpose or anything like that for the grants if you've already received grants to cover that. Um, so it would just be a matter of talking to the people that you receive funding from to see if any of them would be willing to change maybe the purpose of your grant um, to cover that. Or the other thing is um, it may be um, you might be able to um, just cover that from your operational expenses and apply for grant funding for other um, events and things that you've got coming up. 
Awesome. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, so more grant funding questions. So can I apply for funding to help with the operational or maintenance costs of running my charity? What about help to pay for staff? Um, Trish, is that something you can cover? Yeah, so generally speaking, that would be an operational cost. Mm -hmm. So um, most grants through the lottery funding, COGS funding, um, most foundations will fund operational expenses. Um, you just need to check what funds um, do have that incorporated into their funding arrangements and contact them and discuss that further. Thanks, Andrew. Cool, thank you. Um, so on, on funding and grants and uh, the amount that you can ask for, so is there a limit to how many funding grants an organisation can apply for at any given time? Maggie, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, the yes and no. Um, the Lottery Grants Board, they we our like lottery community committee is has two rounds a year, and um, that usually if they come in the first round, you don't come to the second round, and you you do an annual request. Um, Cogs is only an annual funding. However, you can apply to both Cogs and Lottery with from within the department, or even you might be applying to Lottery Community, and you've got a. Um, feasibility study for a building or you've got a facility request so you can have that in at the same time so there isn't a limit on how many funding requests you can put in um, but it is to be mindful because we're all about the outcome so what is the outcome you're trying to achieve awesome thank you for that um, so we've had a few more questions come in as well so one question that we had earlier on during the presentation was, um, how can we get assistance with how to write and apply for a grant as to what the funders are looking for? So many smaller charities can't afford to pay for grant writers. So Maggie, have you got any advice there? Yeah, I saw that one from Vicky Ann. So um, yeah, uh, once again, contact your local advisor. We have lots of different templates and assistant tools that we can provide you with and guide you through how to get onto our system, navigate what, what works. Um, we, yeah, as I said, we've got lots of templates and it's just a case of having a conversation with us um, and we can share our knowledge and guide you through what an outcome looks like, how to write your request. Um, and we get a variety. We get the thesis that people write a lot and then we can get the short, succinct little bullet points of really at what the heart of what people are just needing some assistance with funding for. So it's just about asking the question. And, and coming to a local advisor. Awesome, thank you for that. So just going through a few more of these questions. Uh, one of the first things that we actually got at the beginning was, will you send a copy of the PowerPoint after the hui? And really do appreciate that, you know, um, there's a lot of information and it is a lot coming at you very quickly. So we will definitely be sending a copy of this out. There'll be a resource page, there'll be the full presentation, You'll be able to watch it online once we do a re-recording. So we really want to make sure that there's the stuff is available for you whenever you need it, not just right now. Um, so absolutely. Um, we had another question, which is around ethnic community funding. So I know we, we talked about this a little bit, but it was just who that is available from. So Office of Ethnic Communities is actually part of the Department of Internal Affairs as well. And um, they have a website, www.ethniccommunity these.gobt.nz and so you can find more information about those specific funding opportunities through them. Um, we've had a few, like I said, some specific questions that I think are, are better answered if you take that time to sit down with an individual. Um, we probably can't give the, the detail of advice that we would like to be able to give um, in front of 130 people. So it's just a good opportunity for you to sit down with someone either with charity services or with um, community operations and really, really have a good conversation. Like I said, we do have every Thursday, we've been running one-on-one um, -on -one drop-in sessions. So you can call in um, or you can zoom in, you know, whatever technology works for you. Um, you register for a session, you catch up with one of our people and uh, we can give you some more detailed information on that. We're also working with other government organisations to see who else we can get on board because we really want to be responsive to what the, the sector needs right now. Um, sorry, I'm just going through everybody. 
So um, we have another question, which um, I will be running past Trish. So Lindsay has asked, funders often don't pay wages or pay for a small part. How can we work these costs into our application as wages are often one of the highest costs of a service delivery? Okay, so wages generally form part of um, any group or organisation's operational expenses. And there are funds out there that will fund wages, um, some through the trusts and foundations, certainly Lottery Community and COGS grants will fund wages. Um, generally though, remember that a lot of um, funds make contributions, they don't fully fund, so that's something you also need to think about in that space. But yes, wages definitely are an operational cost, so just check with those funders that you're applying to whether or not they include those expenses as part of their um, arrangements for funding. Awesome, thank you. And um, we actually have another question which I'm going to run past you, Trish, but mm -hmm. it's about, so Sophie has asked us, older people aren't typically the highest priority for a lot of funding initiatives. Do you think more funders will make older people and services to older people a priority in funding? Um, there are some funders that do have older persons as priorities in their funding arrangements. Um, you'll just need to look for those, but I do know mm. that a number of councils particularly in their strengthening communities funds and some of the foundations also include funding. Um, and some other funds have older persons as priorities. But it's not just about the sector itself, it's about the programs and activities that are being delivered. And there's a lot of that intergenerational stuff happening now, which tends to meet um, a lot more of the priorities. So I guess it's also dependent on what projects and activities that you're doing that meet the um, priorities of each funder. Thanks, Andrew. Awesome, thanks, Trish. So um, we did have a few questions that people wanted to run past Michelle. Um, Unfortunately, the, the technical difficulties haven't gotten any less difficult and um, we're not going to be able to run any questions past Michelle at this time. Like, really do apologise for that. Um, if you do have any questions that you would like Michelle to answer, again, email us at events at charities.govt.nz and we'll get in touch with Michelle and we'll get some questions asked. Um, you know, that these things don't always go well on the day, but we're getting there. So I don't think we have any other unanswered questions at the moment. So um, we'll give you a couple of minutes and if there's anything that people really want to ask before we go, happy. Oh, so we just had a question, as I said that there weren't any more. But uh, so this, the question is actually about the logistics. So will the questions be included in the mail out? So last time we did a webinar about a month ago and we did include basically a, a question and answer sheet for both the ones that had been raised in the webinar and answered here, but also ones that we couldn't get to. So we're really committed to making sure that that information goes out to everybody. So we will be doing a little bit of a write up saying what the questions were. We'll go away and make sure that we have a really, really um, good answer if we weren't able to answer it today. And uh, we'll provide that out to everybody. As, as attendees, you will get that first, and then that will also go out on the uh, video link that will be on YouTube. So I think that is us for today, unless anyone has anything that they really want to burning questions. But we just, look, it's, it's been a fun ride. It's been an interesting, if, if bumpy one today. But thank you again, everybody, for sticking with us. And thank you for coming along today. Um, we really do hope you found the information useful and um, you know, really do encourage your feedback on what you'd like to see more of. So as a reminder, we will be providing you with a list of resources and links we've mentioned over the next few days. Um, and we also would like to send you a short survey. So we really appreciate feedback and we're really interested in what you want to see more of as a sector. So if you have ideas on topics that you want to see us cover in the future, please, please, please share them with us. Um, from all of us here at Ngaro Ratonga Kopapa Atapai, Hapai Hapori, and Matatika Matauranga Kaitotoko, thank you so much for coming along today. Ngamehi nui kia koutou katoa. Thank you.